Just when we thought we were going to have a state of the franchise where we're just talking about draft moves, you know, Jason just spoke to Mel Kuyper Jr. about his recent mock, talk about some prospects, things like that. Right before we get on, Brandon Ayuk has officially unfollowed the San Francisco 49ers. From Instagram, sound the alarm. What does it all mean? Jason and I are going to talk about it right after this, but you already know what to do. Drop your spicy sourdoughs in the chat. Smash the like button on both channels. Let's get into the next chapter of the Brandon Ayuk saga right now. That's Jason Aponte. I'm Brad Graham. We're going to get into it all right now. Right, Jason hit with a little bit of a surprise so we are going to get some up close and personal live reactions to Brandon Ayuk unfollowing the San Francisco 49ers I'm just going to toss it to you and ask Jason react I think you're muted we all knew this was coming we all knew this was coming. Um, rinse and repeat. This is the new way that not just 49ers players, but anybody who necessarily is looking for a contract extension of some sort. I guess I don't really have a reaction to it because it doesn't matter. Um, it absolutely doesn't matter. This deal was never going to get done in April. This deal won't be done in May. This deal won't be done in June. It'll be much closer to training camp once Eric Armstead's money comes comes out 6-2. They add more money. They'll figure it out. Obviously, they'll figure out what they can do in the draft and who they need to pay. All of that stuff is absolutely true. I'm not moved by it. But what I'm moved by is who are these people that are monitoring the players' Instagrams and finding that they – like, who was who sitting there today on Friday – and where I'm at, it's like 70 degrees almost. It's it's beautiful over here. Who's sitting there on their phone constantly refreshing Brandon Ayuk's Instagram looking to see if he's following the 49ers? Did he ever follow the 49ers? I also have a different take. Like, I've had, you know, nine to fives before. Um, I never followed any of my jobs. I never followed any of my employers. I never even followed. I never even followed people that I worked with. I never even followed people that I worked with, my my other employees. I never even followed them. Jobs, job, who cares? But I want to know who these people are that are sitting there constantly refreshing Brandon Ayuk's Instagram, waiting to see if he unfollowed them, and then being the person that gets all the engagement. And then I'm just shocked, 49er fans. You've seen the DC dip and twirl that this is, and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, like the siren. He's a... Come on, man. It does it does not matter. This is the new way that players conduct themselves in contract negotiations. Their agencies are pushing them to do it. The people around them are pushing them to do it because it causes this stir. But I will say this. Something always happens usually right before Brad and I go live for some reason. It's always Think something. That's the first thing I thought of. I was like, man, always something goes down. It's always <laughs> something. So this really just feels like something I was very expected. I really don't have too big of a reaction. It's fine. Um, it's funny. Uh, first of all, the guy that I saw who posted it first, Clayton Holloway, um, actually met him at the combine this year. Um, he is Ian Rappaport's right hand man when it comes to being a producer. So he actually saw that I took a picture in the stands at the combine. And he walked down from Ian Rappaport's like media booth, you know, where they have Ian set up at the combine in Lucas Oil. And he just came over and said, what's up? Chopped it up with us um, a little bit. So it's funny. I actually know the guy who, who posted that. Um, and I do know that he is pretty embedded in the NFL network uh, and stuff like that. But 
to the other point of like, are we surprised by this? What are the what are our thoughts on this? I'm per I'm I'm not surprised at all. I I just did um, a live last night where I was like, you know what? I, I don't have the greatest vibes about this situation. Um, you know, I think you just look uh, again at all the motion uh, on social media that's been happening. And again, you just use your brain, right? Like Brandon Ayuk is deserving of a payday. However, the San Francisco 49ers have this awesome tool to their advantage, which is the fifth year option that allows them to have team control of a player heading into year five. And for Brandon's sake, it's $14.1 million. Well, when you stack that against two guys who are about to get paid and CeeDee Lamb and Justin Jefferson, that's arguably one of the best bargains in football outside of Brock Purdy's contract right now. Like that would if if BA, which I don't think he will, but if he does somehow play next year at 14.1. While CD, like I think of that, um, that meme, Jason, where it's Squidward, like looking out of the dark room and there's Patrick and SpongeBob, like running around like, whoo, that's CD Lamb and Justin Jefferson with their new contracts while Brandon Ayuk's just sitting up looking out the window like, all right, well, they're going to force me to play on my fifth year option. Well, these guys are going to go get 35 to 30 million dollars. And I think that's where the issue lies. I think that's why this is happening. We saw that when John Lynch made the reference of we're okay with Brandon Ayuk playing on the fifth year option. That's the bullshit walk thing that came out, right? Um, so to your point, I don't think any of us are really surprised by this. Um, I, I, I said it, I think a week ago that the expectation still remains. There's an invisible deadline at the NFL draft and it's at the end of the first round. If the 49ers get through the first round and Brandon Ayuk still on the roster, then it is expected. He will be on the roster moving forward. And like you said, that's when the deals get cut for the 49ers. June. I'll do you what I'll, I'll do you one better, Brad. I think, pick 20 where the Steelers are, that's your cutoff point. That's, that's your cutoff point, right? Like the Steelers, the Steelers are the ones who are either looking to replace Deontay Johnson in the draft or possibly with Ayuk. If it gets to pick 20 and nothing happens, done. Put it out of your mind. Forget waiting for the entire first round. Everybody else after 20 is fine. They've got their guys. And if not, they're fully prepared to draft somebody. Doesn't mean anything. So again, it is not, it's 20. 20 is the pick. Once you get to 20 and that that's it, it's done. And that is an invisible deadline because stop me if you've heard this before. It was literally the same thing that was happening with Debo Samuel, which is why nobody should be surprised and which is why everybody should understand how this is going to go. And when you look at the fact that Debo Samuel ended up getting paid, why wouldn't someone duplicate that sort of tactic, those sort of measures to get the deal done, you know, and and again, this wasn't going to get done here in April. It wasn't going to get done in May. It wasn't going to get done in June. It's going to get done just like it was for Nick Bosa, just like it was for Debo Samuel closer to training camp, Brad. But pick 20 is where it's at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, it, it is important to look back and, and think that Debo Samuel actually could have gotten traded from everything that we've heard. It's just the 49ers didn't receive a rich enough deal in order to get it done. I believe it was reported that the Jets offered pick 10, which turned into Garrett Wilson, but they wanted Debo. And I believe it was like pick 61 in return. And the 49ers said, no, like we're, that's, we're not giving you Debo and a second round pick for a top 10 pick. Like that's just, that's not going to fly. And as we've seen, Jason, with the San Francisco 49ers, i.e. Jimmy Garoppolo, they will hold on to a player, even if it means putting him on the side field at training camp where he can't play with the other kids at recess uh, until they either come to agreement on a contract or find a trade partner that fits what they're looking for. They aren't going to... I think the biggest thing that we've learned throughout these processes 
is the 49ers don't acquiesce. Does that make sense? Like they don't bend the knee if it doesn't make sense for them. So for Brandon Ayuk to be traded, it would have to make sense from a draft capital standpoint. And that's where it either starts or stops, in my opinion. If the 49ers get an offer for B.A. that they're like, oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. Like, that's good value. That meets that meets the criteria of what it would take. Then I think it would be considered. But that's where I think that's where this really lies is like B.A. is going to try to do what he's going to do to. Uh, utilize his leverage to the best of his ability because he's stuck with this fifth year option looming over his head. And uh, he is going to be underpaid, you know, if he plays on that fifth year option. So it, it's going to be interesting. I'm not sitting here saying like, I believe that the most likely outcome is he makes it through and the 49ers get him paid. But I'm also of the belief that like, I'm not just going to chalk it up and be like, oh, you know, this is nothing. This is par for the course. I mean, it is on one hand, but I think on the other hand, it's like anything can happen in the NFL. And even though we saw Debo Samuel not get traded, that doesn't mean another team doesn't find Brandon Ayuk more valuable. And let's say, like your point, the Steelers are sitting there at 20 and Brian Thomas is gone. Uh, Mitchell is gone. You know, of course, the big three are already out of there. Then they might be like, well, we might have to pay to go up and get a wide receiver like Brandon Ayuk. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. To me, I look at it as it more as things are just heating up a little bit. I think that I think that there is a disconnect and I think that we just got to wait and see. And then if we get through the draft, we know what the outcome is. but. Hold on. Hey, I'm just looking at it like we got two about two weeks to figure out what is going to happen, because, you know, based on things that I've heard behind the scenes, we're kind of aligned on what what's going to happen. So we'll see how it plays out when it's all said and done. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I think it's up to you how you want to perceive it and how you want to kind of contextualize it, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah, and and the the difference between the Debo and Brandon Ayuk stuff is the 49ers already have a first. So they're not in any sort of bind to get into the first, right? Or anything like that. And if you look at the way team needs and and obviously mock drafts are, you know, what they are for whatever they are. Like I did a, a bunch of them last night. I had <laughs> I had Jaden Daniels fall to me at 31 and I'm just like this is completely off, right? Like so these I mocks thought, are in I did a yeah. mock draft too yeah. and I was like why is Jaden Daniels Why is Jaden Daniels here at 31? So these mocks are crazy, right? Like these mocks are insane. But what what I think is is the 49ers are in the first round. With Debo, you could think that they might be a little bit more inclined to move into the first round, right? Like that that's the only other way that I could think of it, but again, this is all this is all par for the course. I'm not going to I'm not going to budge on what I said right before training camp this thing gets done. If not, he may hold out a little bit during training camp, but this gets done. Um the 49ers are not going to get a higher pick um that that people are saying like, you know, the Jaguars or something like that or or something that's in the teens, highly unlikely. Um so, you know, again, par for the course, not really too worried about it, but it does give us something else to talk about because what I've noticed is everybody likes draft content but everybody doesn't like it that much because we're struggling out here. We're struggling out here. We could do a whole, we could do a whole mock draft episode. We could talk about all the prospects that people are just like, they want to know about who the 49ers have drafted. They don't want to know about draft prospects. I think that's the best way I'm seeing it. So, Hey, it at least gave us something else to talk about. Yeah, no, it definitely gave us something to talk about. And like both of us talked about, I think we were both kind of anticipating this. I think we were kind of, you know, uh, it's funny kind of seeing some of the the talking around the deep or around this situation. It's like because, J- Jason, you know, like we are in somewhat of a transition period in regards to media. Like I've I've um, obviously been in the weeds in the social media game for a long, long, long time. 
and I credit uh, the whole thing flipping on its head when George Kittle tweeted at Antonio Brown. I think it was on like New Year's Eve, and it, it came out that it was a dare from Jimmy Garoppolo. But we saw that spin into a six-month cycle of Antonio Brown social media activity being the number one story on basically every top network. And that was really, to me, when I noticed the transition of when social media gained that power, where it was beginning to run the story. So we saw it first with Debo Samuel. And when Debo Samuel did it, it was like still somewhat relatively new. And now it's like you're seeing a lot of how people are reacting to this. And it's just like, oh, it's Debo Samuel all over again. And in in some compass, capacity, yeah, it, it kind it's the same. We saw Kyler Murray do it. Remember when Kyler scrubbed his Instagram uh, before he got into a contract negotiation? So it's not like it's new, but I also want to also want to present it as each situation is individually different. I, I don't think just because Debo's done it before means that this is identical. I, I think there are different situations at hand. Uh, I think when you look at the 49ers uh, roster construction, where they are financially in regards to paying people, I think that changes the conversation a little bit. Whereas like Debo was coming off year three, BA is coming off year four. Heading into year five, you got to pay, you know, we already heard from Jed saying that, you know, Brock is going to get potentially a big time contract. So there's things that you have to kind of keep in mind as well. So I, I, I my hope is that it gets done, um, but I'm also I'm also not going to be blindsided if something happens as well. Well, what we forgot about the Kyler Murray situation was it was. It, all that stuff got deleted because he was grounded for playing too much Call of, Call of Duty. His parents took his phone away and they they wiped away a bunch of his stuff on his Instagram. Ha ha ha. Um. So yeah, look, I think it's important to remember two things. Brandon Ayuk was drafted in the first round. You get a fifth year option. Debo Samuel was not. He was coming off his third year and he wasn't going to play his fourth and final year with yeah. no with no sort of you know extension. So. There's one person who, if they hold out, it you know it looks crazy because it's year four. But someone who is really under contract because year five, you've already been picked up and you're already under a fifth year option. So that's that's the little part. But again, this is the norm for everybody, right? Um, I guess a lot of people are, are. I don't know if a lot of people are nervous, but a lot of people can point to AJ Brown doing it and then it turning into him being ended up being traded. But I think honestly, it's. It's nothing really that we didn't expect, I think, at the end of the day. And we, we found a way to talk about it for 18 minutes. So, you know, thank you, Brandon Ayuk. And, oh, look, we got a super chat. Here we go. <laughs> Junior <laughs> says, my favorite duo, what up, guys? Kind of off subject, but I was wondering if you guys think the 49ers have a shot at Byron Murphy. Much love. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. His stock's rising pretty fast. Uh, it, it looks like he's getting closer and closer to being in a position where if the 49ers want him, they're going to have to trade up for him. Um, and that's that's a great question. I think what we should do, Junior, is stick around for a little bit. After we get to this, this Mel Kuyper quote and we talk about what the 49ers have done and their possible draft strategy, I think this is something to come back to to kind of segue back to it because the 49ers are in a position where they don't need to draft for need. They can draft best player available. And they can be flexible when it comes to how the board falls um, in terms of a trade up. And I think Byron Murphy is somebody who would have to be traded up for if the 49ers want to get him. Yeah, I did a live mock, I think earlier this week. And uh -huh. we just talked about the simulators and how crazy they are and yeah. how the most random guys will be available. Murphy was there at 31 and I, I had to take him because... If you you have a guy who's projected to go, I think probably between 15 and 25, and he's there at 31, and defensive tackle is definitely a hole on the 49ers roster, in my opinion, short and long term, then absolutely you you would take Byron Murphy. And he's he's the perfect prototypical squatty bodied six foot three hundred 
uh zero tech menace uh that i love um people might be afraid of the size but i think i think uh aaron donald did a really good job of kind of eradicating the stigma of shorter squatty body defensive tackles and their impact to the game so if the 49ers could get him at 31 that would be a W. I think you fill a, a he he would instantly start. I think he would start day one as a rookie. And I think as we've talked about with like how the 49ers are going to address and this might be a perfect segue into your um, conversation with Mel Kuyper about his mock draft is you want to get a guy who's going to play at 31. You see class. You know, like that's kind of the that's kind of the whole point of getting that first round draft pick, having um, the ability to get someone in the first round and having the window right now to go make another uh, shot at the Super Bowl. So I think you got to go and do what you got to do. So what do you think? Um, I guess uh, do you want to kind of set up? Um, your conversation with Mel and how that all went about. Yeah, so Mel Kuyper put out a two-round mock draft um, where he chose Rosengarden from Washington and he true f- he and Phillips, right the the corner. And yeah. I think a lot of 49 er fans are on board with a offensive tackle, offensive lineman, right? Like I think I think the only way to make 49 er fans very very happy is to draft all eleven picks linemen. And that'll fix everything um, because, you know, lineman is the only need, you know, on this team, Brad. Like you just uh, draft every single lineman that you can. And, you know, one of these guys is going to pan out. But it was interesting to see him talk about Roger Rosengarten because he pointed to his 1,158 pass blocking snaps with no sacks. But then he talked about his familiarity with Ed McCaffrey. And then we find out that he's working with Joe Staley. So. I had a chance to talk with him and the question wasn't really what's the thought process with Rosengarten is, are you just connecting what you're hearing to what you think is going to happen instead of it being fit? And, and this, this is what Kuiper said. So Kuiper, Kuiper actually gave like a, a good answer about metrics and how sometimes metrics aren't there and how he thinks it's good. But this kind of feels like he's, saying Rosengarten because that's what he's hearing less than what he believes the pick should be right like that's what I got from what he was saying Brad and if you want to play the clip so you can hear the full quote I know people are you know gonna have a tough time like you know probably reading that um you absolutely can but I think it's better to hear it from here can you hear it I can't you can't hear this no all right let me try it a different way uh Can you hear this? Nope. Mm-mm. Hmm. I think the only Try and way... Try from the tweet. I think the only way it might be able to be heard is if I share it, if I have the local video file. That's one of the things that I've noticed that's kind of annoying about StreamYard is like, Oh, you I'll try from the tweet, but it might not. I got you. I can um I can which call it? I can text it to you if you if that makes it easier. Do you have the the actual file because then you might be able to pull it up? I do. I do. Um it is this. Do you hear? Let me see. Do you hear anything? Play it. Play it. I can't hear anything. Here, I got you. Yeah. Shh, shh, shh. All right, it's loading right now. All right, let me see. It's there. You got it? I'm pulling it up right now. Facts. But is your selection a little bit of reading the tea leaves between the connection to Ed McCaffrey and also the fact that Joe Staley's been working with him as well instead of it just being a natural fit? 
you added to what I thought. I just, I did, I, I that, that's an additional couple points, but I just like the kid and like the way he played. And it's a kind of an area where you said, okay, they could look to upgrade that spot. Uh, Rosengarten made sense to me at six, five and a half, 308 pounds. And you look at that four, nine, two and the 30 vertical, but the bottom line is how does he play offensive line numbers? Don't mean a whole heck of a lot, but uh, I remember Jason Fabini ran like a five, five and had a heck of a career in the NFL. So I'm not going to get enamored with some player just because of that, but it showed you what type of athlete he is. In addition to being a blind side protector of Michael Penix jr. That doesn't automatically move. I mean, Boomer, uh, Booger McFarland talked about that today in our meeting. It doesn't automatically move, mean you can move the left tackle. There's are totally different skill sets and different ways of, and of doing it. And some can adapt, some can't. Some it's seamless, some it isn't. Uh, but Roger Rosengarten, I think to me, is a guy that, like TJ Tampa, I think those would be your two guys that I don't think anybody really discusses as high as I have them would be those two players. I don't, I don't see anybody that I've talked People always bring it up to me. Nobody has Rosengarten anywhere near where you have them. So I'm just trusting what I hear from other people. Maybe they don't. I don't know you know, exactly where he'll go. I think he could go late first or early second, but he's a solid player. Uh, people are going to critique him for that last game, just like they critique J.C. Latham for that hiccup at the end of the game or whoever, but the final time you saw them. But it doesn't really tell the story of the type of player that Rosengarten was over the last two years. Thanks, Mo. So, again. He, he said it right there at the end. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is – I I just the way I looked at it when he was giving that answer was he's he's putting together the McCaffrey thing, the Staley thing, and he's probably hearing some things about the fact that the 49ers do like him. But at 31, and See, and, and that's the part that that's the part where we should talk about strategy and, and everything else, like you know, right there, and how the board you have to play the board and the board has to come to you. See what I don't love about that is Mel's been doing this for how long, Jason? Like, oh man, years? I mean, he got called out what, like in the '90s, man. He's been doing this for at least thirty something years. Ta 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 ta. He's ta, been ta, doing ta, it forever, and he's supposed to be a scout. Like, that's the like, right. So that's why I asked about fit. He's talking about what he's heard. Exactly. Like that to me is a fool's errand in considering yourself an evaluator to me you're not an evaluator you're using someone else's evaluation and making it your own and that's how you i would say fail more often than not like that was one thing that i learned really freaking early on in this process of trying to evaluate individual football players is i remember this one guy that i really trusted um i he was high on this one player and I echoed his, his sentiments, right. Without really doing the homework, but I trusted him enough to be like, Oh, I, you know, this guy says it. I agree. Da, 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 da. And he's, he was terrible, the player. And I was like, never again, am I ever doing that? And so that's why, like, when I talk about evaluation, I'm always like, just do the work yourself. Don't like you can cross reference. I think it's fair to cross reference your evaluations to others to kind of see how you align. But there have been plenty, plenty of times where I've cross referenced a player that I'm high on to a guy that I would consider an expert on a specific position and completely disagree with them. And stay true to my evaluation and then ultimately being right. So uh, I and the thing is, too, is I can actually speak on Roger Rosengarten because I've watched him a ton because I've watched Troy Fautanu a ton. Troy Fautanu is obviously like my biggest draft crush right now uh, in this class. And when you watch uh, Roger Rosengarten. Um, he, this is the way that I look at him. He tests phenomenally. Well, you look at his testing numbers. He like, even at the combine, I was like, damn, this dude's moving. Like he really moves really well. His size would also be an indication of like, all right, height, weight, speed, Jason. Remember that conversation that we had where we were talking about how there's a segment of draft Twitter who will knock a prospect if he doesn't fit the height, weight, draft, or height, weight, speed uh, prototypes that they're looking for, um, but they will prop up 
the guys like Amarius Mims because he's huge, but no literal basis in how he plays other than the fact that, oh, he's 6'8", 340. It moves really well. He must be a good football player, right? Look at you see his arm length, Jason. It's phenomenal. This translates to phenomenal NFL player. But that's again, that's how you that's how you miss on on prospects. And so when I look at Roger Rosengarten from like a testing measurable standpoint, like you look at his numbers, it's freaking through the roof. You're like, holy crap. Like this guy like tests really, really well. But when you turn on the tape, he's highly inconsistent. And that's just where like you have to do your evaluation. And it's like, when I when I hear when I when you ask someone about their evaluation and they give you zero information about anything they've seen on tape, throw up the red flag, man. That's that's throw that eval out the window. That that ain't worth worth a lick. And that's not a shot at Roger either. No. Like I think Roger's right around second, third round. I think that's where he no. I think his traits will get him a little bit higher, but he's got work to do. It was very, very surface level based on the amount of pass blocking attempts and the zero sacks and what we and what you said earlier before we got on. How much of that has to do with the fact that Michael Penis gets the ball out very fast as well, too? I mean, I think that's something that we also have to talk about when it comes to that offensive line and quarterback player put together. But it was never, hey, good base. Hey, good hands. He's uh, he's strong at the, at the point of attack. It was none of that. It was none of that. It was he is not allowed a sack, and he knows Ed McCaffrey, and then we find out that Joe Staley was there. So it never really felt like an evaluation in any way. Like, it didn't feel like an evaluation yeah. from Mel. It felt like him hearing something and then – throwing it out there because the 49ers do have a needed offensive line and he's heard this. And then he has those, that unblemished sack record, right. With all his pass blocking snaps. And then he can just throw in the Ed McCaffrey thing. I think a lot of it was just basically what he's hearing. And you can find a way to get Rosengarten without using the 31st pick. Like you absolutely can. Like it, it, it does, it does not require the, It does not require the 31st pick. I know no. that John Lynch said we like to draft good football players and we don't care where they, you know, their perceived value of the players all over the place as opposed to us. And I think I'm finding that out now, um, you know, being a little bit involved with the draft and doing mocks. Um, I get that, but it still doesn't require 31. I don't think anyone is running to the to the podium in the first round or even the top of the second to get Roger Rosengarten. And that's not a knock at him not being a good player or or him not being a successful NFL player is just perceived value right now. You you can see that that's going to be – it's not going to be necessary. It's not going to be necessary. One thing I want to say is I hope you're proud of me. I just pulled a Brad Graham. I just pulled a Brad Graham. I just, uh, I just put out a reel on Instagram, and I cut it up, and it has a video and everything, and I was able to do it in the, in the short moments while you were speaking and to get it done pretty quickly. Oh, you yeah. made a post on yeah. live. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Learn Welcome. from the best. Welcome I learned from the, the best. squad, baby. But that's, honestly, that's again, multitasking at its finest. We love again, it. Again, and, and obviously you see I'm, I'm babysitting here as well, too. Yeah, so I think, multitasking. I think, well, not babysitting. It's my daughter. Um, But the thing is, is this. It's like, <laughs> again, again, Rosengarten – Rosengarden being picked at 31 is too rich. And it doesn't mean that he's not going to be a good tackle. And it doesn't mean that he's a bad prospect. But at 31, there is a way for you to pick someone at 31 who is a very good player because there's going to be a very good football player that's going to fall down to you because of the way the draft goes. And then if you really, really, really want Rosengarten, you can move up in the second round if you feel like someone is gonna is gonna jump up. You don't have to do that at 31. That doesn't mean it's a bad pick, but at 31, I don't like it. Yeah, no, that's that's an awful pick at 31. Um, I, I think I think it's really as simple as this. If, if Rosengarten's tape, if his tape matched his testing, he would be a first round draft pick, but it doesn't. So that that's again where draft t Twitter seemingly just struggles every year with instead of just watching the tape and i get it like we've talked about it so many times um is that evaluating offensive line is hard 
It, it's a challenge. The only reason I'm any good at it is because I played offensive line. And if I if I didn't play offensive line, I'd probably be terrible at it. Um, it's really hard. It's it's challenging. And so when when someone's explaining their pick and they're not giving any type of anything, that's that's a red flag. And if when you hear when you start to hear measurable references, uh, testing references, statistical references, and not really anything that anyone does good on film, you're like, oh, well, we'll we'll see we'll see how that goes. But uh, and, a good and, question, though. Good, I thought that was a great great way to attack the question. Right, because, like, I, because I, we found the answer. We right. found the answer. Because I could have just said, I could have just said, "Hey, what are your thoughts on Rose Garden?" He would have been like, "Yeah, you know, blah, 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 blah. he does speak very fast." And and honestly, shout out to Mel Kiper, man, that was really cool, like to be able to do something like that. So it's not disrespectful or anything like that. But no. I, I felt like We're asking the runner, yeah, ask the run of the mill question about his thoughts on Rose Garden weren't going to give us anything that he didn't write down or anything like that. But for me, I was just trying to put the tea leaves together because we're the smoke chasers. Ed McCaffrey yeah, was his go. coach. Joe Staley is training with him. You know, he's starting to put the pieces together. You're hearing something. It doesn't necessarily mean. And because you're hearing something, and if that was the pick, it means that either Kyle or whoever is doing the O-line, um, you know, I guess evaluations, that's his guy. Like, again, perceived value. If that's their guy, they're just, they, don't, they don't care where. They don't care where. They don't care where he's going right. to fall, right? Like, it's we're going to draft our guy because that's all we care about. Everything else is letting people just yell in the background. Fans are going to be upset at pick 31 regardless. Let's just I make sure we put like that. that. I do feel Let's like make that. sure we put that out there. There is no one player at pick 31 that every single fan is going to throw their hands up and say, that's the pick. We nailed it. Now we are the world and let's hold hands. So let's get that out of the way. Whether it's offensive line, whether it's defensive line, whether it's cornerback, whether it's wide receiver. No one pick is going to be loved. That's it. It's just the, so someone's going to be disappointed. Many people are going to be disappointed. I mean, we're 49ers fans. How often are we disappointed? <laughs> Dude, hey, you got to make a TikTok or like a, a real uh, like, hey, we're 49er fans. <laughs> Dude, I've been thinking about that. We're 49ers fans. Of course, we're going to dox each other over a quarterback discussion on Twitter. We're 49er fans. Of course, of course, I'm going to invite you to fight me at the next home game. We're 49ers fans. Of course, next year is our year in Quest for Six. Like, something like that. <laughs> please. Please do it. It would be so good. I think you would nail it, too. I think you do a really good job at being able to really capture the online persona fan, in-person, in-real-life fan. <laughs> we're 49ers fans. Of course, we're going to laugh at Dallas and Philly for losing, and then we're going to lose the next round. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh we're 49ers fans. Of course, our high no, no, no. No, no, it's fine. Look, we're just laughing through the pain, guys. That's it. It's it. This is high level content right here. This is like the highest level content right here. 100 percent And and Brian was right on point with uh the way this Quite. one fits in. Quite says, uh, did y'all see Purdy going on a road trip show with McKivitz? Be prepared to be disappointed this draft Niners fans I all right we are 49ers fans of course Rich Madrid told me to watch the tape <laughs> <laughs> um we're 49ers right. fans of course Rich Madrid has yelled at us right of course he's called us a bozo um yes. <laughs> look Cole McKivitz is going to be on this roster regardless right and I'm going to restate my opinion with this is the 49ers are not telling you that we're running it all the way back with this offensive line straight up and we're not going to fix anything. The 49ers are giving themselves a safety net of we've won a ton of games with this 49ers team, with this 49ers line, and if push comes to shove, it's not plan A, but if it ends up being plan B, plan C, plan D, and we draft linemen that aren't ready, then we still have someone who's played a lot of snaps and. Dare I say, Brad, I know this is hard for people to understand sometimes about players, but maybe he might get a little bit better. Like, he might just get better, like, one full year under under his belt. 
But I don't think the 49ers are telling you they're running this line back. What they're doing is they're putting themselves in a position where we can take an lineman, right? We can take a lineman. We'll bring him to camp. If he wants to compete, he can compete. If he doesn't win, then we still have McKivitz. But if he kicks everyone's ass, McKivitz is now on the bench. And he can be a guard. He can be a left tackle in a pinch. He can turn into that brunt skill role. So with this, McKivitz is definitely going to be on the team because he's extended. But I don't think at all, I don't think at all they're telling you they're running this line back and they're not going to try to improve in the in the, in the the draft at all. I don't think so. No, I think they'll draft offensive line. And it's just where. Where are they going to draft offensive line? <clears throat> and And how do they – perceive trying to actually do that uh for me trade up if you really want to improve your offensive line uh if if you're staying at 31 you have to go bpa you got to even if you think you need offensive line and you got a you got a defensive tackle you got a cornerback <laughs> if you got kool-aid mckinstry sitting there you go kool-aid over like a Jordan Morgan or a, a Kingsley Suomataia, I feel like I feel like you got to go best. You got to go BPA. Like you can't, and that's what having that offensive line offers them is yeah. they can go BPA and they can kick out offensive line needs to the future or to the to this you know third second third fourth round. And hey, you look at guys like Zach Tom who the 49ers could have had. Um, but he's turned out to be a very quality offensive lineman uh, that was drafted in the fourth round. Um, as guy was banging the table for them to get, they opted to go a different route. And, uh, hey, they're now looking for additional upgrades. And this is a perfect segue to draft strategy. So if you want to pull back up, um, I believe it was Junior's um, Super Chat because it, uh, the 49ers. This one? Yep, because the 49ers signed another cornerback. Rock Yassin. And yes. now there's this idea that now the 49ers are not in the market in the draft at all for a cornerback. I don't agree with that either. Mm -mm. I don't agree with that either. I think when you're filling your roster now early on before the draft, you put yourself in a position where you're like, well, if the worst case scenario is Rock Yassin, Yidium, have to play on the outside, and you keep Lenore on the inside, and you still have Charbarius there, that's not the worst thing. But if the 49ers get an impact corner, those guys are not locks to make the team. You don't have to keep them on the 53. Yeah, Averly, you don't have to keep them on the 53. They're not locks to make the 53. None of that means the 49ers are tipping their draft strategy hand. What it means is the 49ers now are flexible and can do whatever they want. Best player available. Trade up if they identify someone. They can wait on guys. None of those guys are the reason the 49ers won't draft the cornerback. I, Isaac Gideon had a really good season last year for the first time in his career as a New Orleans State on the outside. He had a very good season. Can't lie about that. Sounds like the 49ers are thinking that he might have found something and they think that they can keep that going. Rock Yassin didn't play much last season, but when he did, he played well. And I think he's got draft pedigree. And again, when you have a guy who was regarded in the draft, they usually get shot after shot. But neither of those guys are going to are going to be the reason that the 49ers don't go with a cornerback. Like I, I don't understand that thought process. It may make it less likely that they need to go ahead like early on. But I think if the right guy falls, like if Kool-Aid McKinstry is there, you think the 49ers are going to say, nah, man, um, I've got we've got Isaac Gideon and Rocky Yassin. We're good. We're solid over here. Like that's not going to be the reason. But what the 49ers are doing is keeping themselves flexible so they can play the board best player available. And I think that's what is exciting about this draft is they can do whatever they want. And there's no right or wrong way to build a roster. It just depends on. Are they going to really do best player available or are they just going to do an entire draft of these are our guys and these are the guys we're going to draft regardless of where they are? Yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. Uh, <clears throat> Iceman wanted to know, where's my super chat? It's right here. It says, don't know what hurts more, the Super Bowl loss, loss or the last episode of X-Men 97? Super Bowl loss. 
That's always going to be the Super Bowl loss. If anybody knows anything about comic book characters, and I'm not going to give what happened away. Excellent episode. By the way, X-Men 97, absolute cinema. Um, we're absolutely seated. You know, between that and Invincible finishing and having this to keep going with, it's great. But if we know anything about comic book characters, comic book characters never stay dead. So I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, no. The Super Bowl, by far, and away. Not even close. Still get flashbacks. Cap says, Brandon paid Ayuk BPA, my draft approach. <clears throat> that's a good draft approach. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen before the draft. Any type of payment for Brandon Ayuk is going to be long, drawn out, painful, sleepless nights potentially for all those involved, and most likely gets done in the wee hours before training camp. And, of course, barring that Brandon Ayuk is on the roster beyond the NFL draft. Uh, apparently, the Steelers are hot and heavy for a wide receiver. Just seeing a, uh, a report from 93.7 The Fan saying there are internal discussions about uh, Bengals star receiver T. Higgins. That's was crazy to trade him in the division. A franchise tag, right? Um, not it's kind of similar to BA in a sense. It's a form of a tag. One's franchise, one's fifth year. Um, but hey, teams are gonna be out there uh looking for wide receivers. I don't think that the Steelers feel ultimately super comfortable with Pickens as their number one after they traded Deontay Johnson away. So we'll see. We'll see what the 40 or not the 49ers, the Steelers do. Um, but again, um, you have to have someone who's willing to pay. Yeah. If BA is a part of those conversations, what yeah. are they willing to pay? And what will the 49ers take? I think that that is a really, really big question of if anything goes down with BA, because I don't know. What who's offering what the Patriots would the Patriots be interested in BA services? Because I don't think an early second round pick will do it. Well, let me ask you this too. Doesn't Brandon IU kind of have a say in where he wants to go, where he should go, anything like that when it comes to this? Right? I, would I mean say if, so. Yeah. All right. So you're the Pittsburgh, you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you you rightfully want Brandon IU, right? If I'm Brandon IU, and the reason that I kind of want out is one, because I want to get paid, and two, because I want to get the ball a lot. You think the best way to get your number one targets is to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers with Russell Wilson and or Justin Fields and Arthur Smith's offense. No, I don't that's, think that's I don't think that's think, the way to do it. You think that's the way <laughs> you think you think going to an offense led by Russell Wilson at this stage of his career. Arthur Smith is the offensive coordinator. George Pickens isn't going anywhere and is going to want his. You think that's the way? That's the team that's going to get you, make you a target hog, give you the ball. To, what? Russell Wilson is going to throw the ball 27 times this season, and they're all going to be the tight ends. Like, that. this is Arthur, and, and none of them are going to be the good tight ends. It's not going to be Pat Fryer, Muth. They're going to throw the ball 27 times to Darnell Washington. Like, what do we know about Arthur Smith? Arthur Smith will look at his best player or one of his better players and say, nah, let's let's throw it to John o. Smith. Never mind Kyle Pitts. B. John Robinson, no thank you. Go sit down. Tyler Algier. Uh, Drake London, no thank you. Matt Collins. Literally. What in, <laughs> what on earth would make Brandon Ayuk believe that going to the Steelers would be where he's going to get targets? He would literally go there and get less targets because – Arthur Smith thinks he's smart by saying, I know you think he's good, but I'm going to throw it to the other guy who isn't as good, and we're going to use that. Like what? That's, that's so funny, dude. He had like three of the premier athletes at each individual position, and he's like, you know what? We're going to go with the – we're gonna go with the guys who are either journeymen or or what have you. Like that's that's a that's a better idea, I think. Hey, Kyle Pitts, you know you're really fast and you're really you know you're really big, but you know what, man? Let's throw the ball to John Smith a hundred times. Like let's get him involved. Bijan, 
you're incredible, man. Like, you really can break tackles. You can catch the ball. You're great with the ball in your hands. We're going to hand it off to Tyler Algier. Like, it, it's literally, like, right there in front of you. Like, the, what on earth makes – and then you throw in the quarterback situation. Why on earth would Brandon Ayuk ever want to go there? And Mike Tomlin is not going to let that go crazy because he allowed Matt Canada be to be crazy over there as well, too. Now, a lot of that has to do with their quarterback. But come on, man. Like, going is to the Canada Steelers, still there or did they no, go somewhere else? Arthur Smith. Oh, Arthur Smith. Oh. Yeah. Like Arthur watch, Smith. Basically. Yeah. I mean, like, Najee Harris is going to take a back seat to Jalen Warren. Like, 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 book it. Like, book it. <laughs> Pat Fryer move, take a seat. Here comes Darnell Washington. Book it. So I don't understand why Brendan Ayuk would think that Pittsburgh would be the place that he can go to get number one targets when Arthur Smith has no interest in not only doing what's right and getting the your best players the ball, he hates fantasy football. <laughs> like, like literally tells you to his face. <laughs> P.J. Robinson was injured. Cool. I'm not even going to give you time to get him out. Or he was sick. I'm not even going to give you time to get him out. Like, come on, man. He's he's the worst. He's the absolute worst. Nothing is going to get better there in Pittsburgh. Nothing. Yeah, no. I could see. So the, I think the interesting angle would be is if, if Jaden Daniels goes number two overall to Washington to Adam Peters, then you have Terry McLaurin. You have Jahan Dotson. Um, they lost Curtis Samuel, right? So, yeah, and Jahan feels like he could be uh, maybe more effective out of the slot. And if if you want to talk about fit, you want to talk about teaming up with your your homie. Um, I mean, but again, what are you getting? You're not you're not getting. Well, does Washington have multiple first round picks? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, if I'm not mistaken, who has multiple first round picks? Um, multiple whoever... top ten picks. It's the Bears, right? The Bears. Yes, have the Bears picks. because of uh, the the DJ Moore trade. Right, 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 right. But and the Bears, yeah. I think they're locked in on Caleb and you Duns. Right, that would make more sense. You get two rookies coming at the same time. Yeah, uh, you already got Keenan Allen as your veteran. And uh, DJ Moore, Keenan and Allen, you Duns. And, and oh, you dance those. Oh, dude, that's a oh man, <laughs> dude, that would be that would be crazy, man. That, 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 that would be fun. And you could go, uh, you could go offensive line, whoever falls out in the early second, too, and get a guy there. So, hey, Chicago Bears could turn it around pretty quickly here. Um, but obviously, we're, we're more kind of talking about like, well, fits where would BA potentially go, like, where. Um, and who's willing to give up? And would the Colts give up pick fifteen for him? You know, like would they give would they give that up to to team him up with Pittman and Downs? Uh, you know, to to have Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson. Like you, you just kind of go down the list of like potential fits. Who's who would be in the market for Brandon Ayuk to even like have that as a conversation? of potential trade targets i'm right. not really and that's why and that's why you bring up the steelers is because the steelers are absolutely ready to fill a, a, a spot with you know deontay johnson like that makes sense but everywhere else everyone else is either situated with their receiving group um or is in prime position to get another receiver right like we were right. thinking about obviously the new york giants was somebody that was floated around before this all happened and everything as well but the new york giants are in a spot where they can get malik neighbors now and he'll be cost controlled. And I love you, Brandon Ayuk, but the difference between getting Malik Neighbors for the cheap for four years, I'll kick that can down the road for a while before I bring in Brandon Ayuk and have to pay him right now, in my opinion, especially trying to rebuild. Neighbors is 20 years old as well. I did not yes. know that. That's yes. crazy. Yes. I thought he was 22, 23. Nah, he's 20. That means you're you're likely paying him when he's turning 24, right? Uh, which is unbelievable. But like yeah, I team, mean, you... a, a team can have a need, but if if it comes down to it, and I can draft a guy, even a, like a cheaper uh, like a cheaper option, he may not turn into Brandon Ayuk. But I mean, for four years, I get to have a cost control guy that that has like good draft pedigree, as opposed to paying somebody right away, especially if the team isn't going anywhere. Um, I I just don't see that happening. I don't see it happening. 
If we had to talk about teams in the first round who need a number one wide receiver, I would say the New England the Patriots at three. You're saying the Jags at where are they selected? 17. 17. I would say the Tennessee Titans could use. Uh, they did. They got a bunch of old fogies over there right now in um, uh, DeAndre Hopkins and the guy that they just signed for 92 million. So I don't know if they'll be in the market. Calvin for, Ridley, I doubt it. Yeah. And then yeah, and- Burt seems to be on his way out. Right. Makes sense. Uh, Atlanta Falcons, they could use a compliment to uh, Drake London mm-hmm. uh, with Kirk Cousins. That could be an option. Uh, we talked about the Chicago Bears, most likely not. Minnesota Vikings, uh, they are I feel like they're trying to get a quarterback. So they're either going to get a quarterback or – and they can't pay Justin Jefferson and Brandon Ayuk. No, they That's can't, so they're out. they're out. They're out. Um, Denver Broncos, they trade to Jerry Judy. Cortland Sutton's getting long in the tooth. They got guys out there like Mark. Mims. What, uh, they got Mims, but they could be a potential suitor um, just because I don't know how long Cortland Sutton's going to be vibing around there. New Orleans Saints, they got Olave, Shahid. Shahid's pretty good. Shahid's pretty good. But they could use another option as well. What's his name? Yeah, but, but now we're getting – so now we're getting into the spots in the draft. We're at 14. The, we're at 14. Right okay. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. 15 would be the Colts. We talked about their fit. Yeah. And then we have Seattle. We're not trading in division. You mentioned Jacksonville Jaguars at 17. Cincinnati Bengals. If they're not paying T. Higgins, they're, they're not, not going to do that to get Ayuk. Nope. Rams at 19, not going into division. Nope. Pittsburgh Steelers at 20. That's your cutoff point. That is your cutoff point right there. If it doesn't happen by 20, it is not going to happen. I don't want any other picks after. Could you see Miami Mike making a play at 21 to get B.A. over in South Beach to team up with Tyreek Hill? But no. keep in mind Tyreek's making 30. Yeah. B.A.'s looking for 25 to 30. That, yeah. You have two very high-priced and they got Waddle. They got Waddle. Good point. Yeah. Can't so I mean, I think I think twenty. What is twenty one? We're at right now with Miami. Twenty one with Miami. Then it's Philly, Vikings, Cowboys, Packers. Nah. Nah. Yeah. Nah, yeah. Nah, yeah. Nah, Tampa Bay. Nah. 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 It's over. Like Arizona, once 20, nah. 20 Bills are, are twenty eight. Bills no, are twenty eight. No. I why? Think why? Be... Why would I move up three spots? Why? And 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 the Bills are going to want thirty one. And the Bills are well, no, you would have to say to the Bills, like, you're not getting 31. We're not giving but, you anything else. We have to get 28. And no. I would even say you have to get more than just no. 28. I don't I don't want it for three spots earlier. And what I was going to say is 21 seems like a perfect spot for the 49ers to trade up to if someone that they really like gets into a spot for them that they really like. 21. Because if it's a player that the Dolphins don't need and right. they're they're identifying, right? Like they can entice them there. But right after the Steelers, once it gets to 20, that's it. That's it. None, nobody, 21, 22, 20, none, nothing all the way down there because it's not worth it at that point. It is not worth it at that point at all. So to move up three spots and then to strengthen the bills for what? Like why? Like I, I don't understand that. Um, you get yeah. some back end picks, but I I I I'm not doing that for 28. Only what is it? Um, you have to be blown away. I'm not blown away by getting a pick three. Three picks ahead of me. That's not getting blown away. Like one first rounder is not going to get it done. Yeah, no. Gotta... Getting pick twenty eight for Brandon Ayuk would be. I wouldn't call that a return on investment. I feel like you'd be taking a loss if you're running an economic game. If you're just tra- if it was just BA for twenty eight, I would say that would be an L for the 49ers. Yeah, I don't feel good about that. You know, again, it, it would have to be blown away. Like, we're talking about, like, 17 and up. Or if somebody got froggy, like, early on. like I Yeah, for that, me, it'd, but... be, it'd have to be 15 and up, and it's right. uh, or it's a non-starter. And I'm also not adding anything on to that. Like, And I'm also, like, still in the mindset, like, I might need a little sweetener right. to, like, really make me feel convicted in accepting and, a trade. Because, and, as we've seen, the DeForest for 13 – that wasn't a trade that, you know, it didn't work out in the end. 
And yeah. I just I don't want to see that. And I, again, we hey, hey, you're a 49er fan. You have PTSD like we have PTSD for a lot of things and trying to trade a player of B.A.'s caliber and thinking you can hit on a rookie, um, especially at a position that have had a really hard time finding initial success with the 49ers. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's also a challenge. Yeah. And, and again, it have to be something crazy. It would have to be something crazy. So I know that I could get myself in the range of like getting like neighbors or you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I love I, this. I must, I, love not be, I must not be paying attention to the chat because I have no idea what this means. You don't get this reference? No. It's uh it's it's a Chappelle show reference. Um sometimes cucumbers taste better pickled. And the and the guy goes, huh? He's like, huh? He's like, huh? He's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that I love right. I'm a I'm a I love the Chappelle show. I love the deep cuts. I love the deep cuts. I love the deep cut. So good, Lorenzo. So good. But again, I, I would have to be I would have to be in a position where I feel like I can get Malik neighbors or you you dons. Um, you know, like that's the only way, right? Someone who's very cheap and I know for a fact is going to be a great player in this league. I think the top three, the top three wide receivers are slam dunks. I think Marvin Harrison is gonna be great. I, I think Marvin Harrison's gonna be great. I think I think neighbors is gonna be great, and I think Rome's gonna be great. I think all three of them are gonna be great. And I don't think that there's really much to think about with them. But if I'm not in a position to get them, then all these other guys that we feel good about and that possibly can be good in the in the league, it's not worth it. Like later, like later on at that point, take the known commodity. If I can get one of those home run guys and cost controlled home run guys with a fifth year option, bet. But these other guys that we feel good about that are, that'll possibly be good, I'll take the established guy that's been here for a while. What about Raiders at 13? Devontae Adams getting long in the tooth. Uh, you know, Pierce is BA's former coach in college. Mm -hmm. I also think Pierce recruited BA. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so there's a relationship there. Could that be could that be a fit potentially? I, I would say from a value perspective, 13 would be a pretty solid value. The only reason that I don't think so is I think that the Raiders are dead set on getting a quarterback one way or another at 13, whether that's moving up to make sure that they get Jaden Daniels, who Antonio Pierce likes, that they find a way to get that done, or just it's just absolutely position. or just absolutely pushing the envelope and just saying we're taking Penix here at, at 13 because we want to make sure that we lock in a guy, which I, I personally wouldn't do. I just think they're locked in on a quarterback. Yeah, I just don't see that the Raiders being able to to move up from thirteen to two. Oh yeah, I, mean, I don't think so. I don't think so either. I, 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 the Forty Nine ers twelve to three was yeah. a first round pick swap right. plus two additional first rounds and a third, I believe. So the way you get that conversation started is if Washington takes May at two. That's Max. the way you get. If that's but the way I you think get the Patriots are dead set on taking a quarterback too. Well, they are, but the Patriots have also let it be known, like, hey, if you want to jump out the window and give us four first rounders or this and that, you know, like this way, you know, we will. Because they're we'll kind listen. of more in a complete rebuild. Type they're in an absolute complete rebuild. Like, New coach. Like, yeah. Everything. GM, so, all that. I don't think you, I don't think they should. Like, if they have a chance to get a quarterback right now at three, I think you definitely lock that in or whatever. And I don't think the yeah. Raiders are going to make it to three either. You know, no. I just think they're going to force the issue by doing something very Raider like uh, with their pick and get and going too crazy on Penix because they're scared that somebody is going to, that somebody is going to let him, you know, if somebody's going to get him before they can get him on the way back. Let O'Connell cook, man. Go BPA. See what you get. Oh, no, nah, he's nah. cooking. He's cooking hot dogs with pop tarts. My God, no! <laughs> oh, you think Penix going first round? Someone's gonna absolutely force it. I think someone's absolutely gonna force it because nobody wants to be left with Bo Nix, like being the only uh or 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 Spencer Rattler. And Bo Nix is yeah. fine. And Bo Nix is fine. Think, it's just I it think gets, people gets would rather miss on actually selecting the guy. Then miss on him being a hit. You know what I mean? I feel like that almost haunts them more. Like, at least they could be like, oh, we tried, you know, and it didn't work out. But if you don't take him and you see the Brock Purdy situation play out, obviously extreme polar opposites from a couple rounds to the end of the draft. But yeah, um, you, I think there's like a bit of a, a FOMO 
that's created fear right. is missing now you know yeah, like that's it you start to see that quarterback run it's almost like in your fantasy drafts right you're like oh i'm gonna wait on running back and you I'm start to see right running now. backs you start to see running backs happening and you're like oh and, and then you get all panicky and you for you're just like i need a starting running back then you, yeah then and you end up with pool starts right. just dwindling yeah. and dwindling dwindling it, it starts to get down to like you having zach moss in cincinnati as your starter and you're just like no 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 i can't i can't i can't <laughs> Like uh, I can't do that, and then you you force a pick. Like I think I think they will start to look around and and really really make like a panic decision because they don't want to be on the outside looking in. And not that Bo Nix won't be good, not that uh, Spencer Rattler won't be good. I just don't want to be left with those two at the end and have to make that decision. That you know, like I would, I I could definitely see them doing that. That's absolutely wild timing. That right when you said Bo Nix. I'm in the middle of a dynasty draft. Bo Nix was selected at the same exact time you said Bo Nix. That was kind of wild, but means absolutely nothing to the show. Um, you're muted. That's the thing, too, is, you know, talking about like dynasty superflex leagues, like, is Caleb Williams the, the slam dunk number one pick? Like, I don't know, man. I might, if, if I, well, need I can it, tell I... you where he went in this draft, did he go first? So this is a startup draft. He oh, startup Superflex. Okay. Yeah, it's a startup. CJ Stroud went one. Makes sense. Patrick Mahomes went two. Hurts okay. three. Allen, Jackson, Burrow, yep. Caleb. Okay. So Caleb. Our, all right. Again. So let's say you started seventh that draft. overall. Seventh let's overall. Let's say you started that draft out and you were like, I'm gonna wait on quarterback, right? And then you start to see those elite guys going. You're just gonna like put your finger over Kirk Cousins in Atlanta and just smash it in because you're just like, oh, I gotta get a starter, a guy who can like, you know. And then like you look around at what you could have had, and, and you're just like, damn, you panicked a little bit, bro. Like I, so they're doing startup with rookies. They're not doing like you pick the kicker and like and then. So like, this is the first time that we've thrown like I've been a part where they throw rookies in. I actually like it because you can get value on later rookies because everyone's kind of scared. So you can actually like identify the play prospects you like. And so like Kirk Cousins, he went at 310. So Christian McCaffrey went right after that. Um, and then you had like T it's a tight end premium too. So you had Kincaid, TJ Hawkinson, DJ Moore, uh Justin Fields went in the at 410. Um or no, I'm mistaken. We had a, it was McCaffrey, Kincaid, Tyreek Hill, Kyron Williams, Devontae Smith after Kirk Cousins was selected. And but there was all, funny. all the quarterbacks were gone. Like there was like, they were and gone. Jaden Daniels had already went, Tua went, Jared Goff went at 3 8. So like, there what's weren't funny, very many quarterbacks left. What's funny is, is if the Bills don't draft a guy, then Kincaid becomes their, they're like, like Kincaid's gonna have to turn into Kelsey for him, like in the way that Mahomes use it, uses him, right? So I get the thought process, but if they draft like a Donnie Mitchell, um, that kind of throws a monkey wrench into your plans, right? Like, so that's what's funny yeah. about like th those drafts and everything early on. I personally like it when you do the thing where if you put a kicker in, that means you get a pick. So the first right. kicker is the one one, the second kicker is the one two, yeah. the, you know, and then you like you you do it all the way because around. Because you know if you're drafting, you know what situation yeah. they're yeah. in. And then right, know. and then you can just go get the vets, and then you can go, you know, like if I want to double up and I look around and I'm like, damn, I don't have a quarterback. Well, I can just go get Caleb Williams as a need, like you know, what one one. So yeah, so like I took JJ McCarthy in the fifth round after so my quarterbacks Future are Bur my my quarterbacks are Burrow, Purdy, and McCarthy. So that's what we're rocking with. Yep. So trying to go for Purdy recreating his magical because Purdy was great in fantasy last year. Like, oh, yeah. He killed it in my Scott Fishbowl League. I had him and Lamar and so Jordan Love. Purdy finished um, in regards to last year sixth in PPR and sixth in half half PPR yeah. as well. So, I mean, pfft. And I got him as the twelfth quarterback off the board. Right. So it was again one of those situations where it was just quarterback run, quarterback run, and I was like, I'm gonna be a homer. I'm gonna take yep. my guy Purdy and uh, stack him with Burrow. And I wanted one rookie, and I got you know like Caleb went in the at first round, Jaden went in the third round, 
I got McCarthy in the fifth. I feel pretty confident about that because I think he's going to go a, ho- a lot higher than people in. He's a Viking. Yeah, he's going somewhere, and I think he's going to have a really good shot at starting uh, year one. Um, but that again, Viking. we'll see. We'll see where he goes. But uh, we'll see what happens with the whole NFL draft in general. Yeah, I'll be there, pal. Uh, I'm, nice. I'm packing my bags and I'm going, so I'll be able to talk with Pick Thirty One, <laughs> whatever. Well, hopefully, Pick Thirty One's to... there. No, yeah, the for all the first, all oh, that's right, right, because only fifteen have gone. Yeah, good call, good call. Darius yeah. Robinson looked like the only guy outside of the top fifteen that's not going to go. Yeah, that's other than go. that, it seems like Slim Pickens. Uh, that's not good. Didn't... They'll figure yeah. it out. They'll figure it out. I mean that's a that's a hard spot to be in. You don't want to be the the Will Levis, right? Right. I, I think we figured that out. You don't want to be that guy that could go in the twenties that slides out of the first, well, and you're just sitting there in the green room, and then you have to make the decision: Do I come back the next day? Do I go home? Like and all that crap. So the thing is, too, is like I remember the 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 first draft I covered, which was in Vegas. Brees was there for the first round. And then he didn't get picked in the first round, but he was like the first or second pick out of the second round. So he was actually available for the press conference as well, too. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of interesting with that. We'll see. I, I bet I bet we'll hear a little bit more about other guys being there. So hopefully some of the big boys will be there um, in case they get picked so I can ask them questions. But regardless, I'll still be there, you know, boots on the ground, talking to people, figure out what's going on. Absolutely. Uh, Detroit. You gotta take a picture with that Detroit sign that they put up. Nah, I gotta, I gotta go grab a beer with Don Burr. Don Burr, if you're in here and I saw <laughs> he you, he was earlier, in here earlier. Yeah, if I and I saw you earlier, somebody let Don Burr know. Put the word out. I want to grab a beer with the legendary Don Burr. So let me know once I'm done with work and everything. Let's go, uh, Don Burr. Hit my line, man. <laughs> Don Burr, hit up Jason, and uh, yeah, well, hey, we got something to talk about today. I, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> like when that when that stuff came across, I'm like, oh look, we have something to talk about. Like, honestly, I feel like we're kind of slowly just getting desensitized by everything. Yep. And hey, you're a 49er fan, you're dead inside. Like that's just kind of the vibes right now. So we'll see how it all plays out. The whole Brandon Ayuk thing, again, envisionable, uh, invisible finish line. Uh, is at the draft, and we'll see what ultimately happens. Until then, it's social media watch uh, for to see how this situation plays out because you know the 49ers aren't going to say nothing about it. And uh, other than that, we just got to wait and see. And uh, that's that's where we're at. Any last words, comments, thoughts, concerns, anything regarding the San Francisco 49ers. No, we're good. Thanks for uh, guys for tuning in. It's been uh it's been a wild time trying to do draft content. It's it's not hitting the way that, you know, we thought even though they have a first rounder. So, I'm glad you guys tuned in. It's always good uh to, you know, see you guys in here in the chat and all your support and everything. So, thank you guys for watching and uh yeah, we'll keep it going. We're almost there. I think uh I think the content goes crazy when the 49ers when you find out who the 49ers have drafted. Yeah. I think a lot of, a, a lot of people want to know they don't want to know about all the draft prospects. They want to know about they want to know about who the 49ers selected. So I, I think really, I think yeah, that's where it goes. I feel like the average fan is still just in pain. And they're still just kind of like, oh well, now we got to talk about BA. Like I don't want to ingest 49ers content. Like right. And so I think when the draft happens, we'll be good to go. We'll have our players to talk about. Uh, rookie OTAs and uh, no rookie mini camp and mm-hmm. OTAs would be right around the corner. Then we break for the, the the real dead period, and then, but hey, training camp it means training camps not too far away. Yes, sir. So uh, shout out to everyone as ever, uh, as always for tapping in. Make sure you like and subscribe to both channels. All that good stuff. I'm Brad, that's Jason, State of the Franchise, we out. That's Jason Aponte, I'm Brad Graham, we're going to get into it all right now.